Hey everybody, Kev Walsky here, checking in with our very first hashtag Star Trek Picard Season 1, Episode 1 Review. The episode is upon us! Oh! This episode was really fantastic. Fantastic. Clearly, the creators behind this are attempting to try to, I guess, get rid of that stigma that every first episode and first season of a Star Trek show kind of sucks. They are attempting to knock it out of the park, which I truly believe that they have. I've watched it four and a half times at this point, and I'm struggling to find any real big issues with it. Honestly, the show kind of is perfect at this point. I think this was the perfect episode from the cinematography, the acting, the lighting, the music, the editing. I don't know if I already said that. The writing, I don't know if I said that. Literally everything is just so perfect. I, I really love this episode and I do understand that may include some of my nostalgia berries kind of attacking me to make me want to love this more than what it is, but I have watched it multiple times to kind of break different sequences down and I'm still struggling to find any real issues with it. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to share some of my favorite sequences with you guys from the episode and then I'm going to go ahead and dive into two major plot points that are happening right now, which is the mystery of Dodge and her sister, and of course the situation that is happening with Picard and Starfleet and the Romulans. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. The very first sequence opens up with Commander Data and Picard sitting inside of the 10 Forward Lounge. Now, we've seen this a bit in some of the teaser trailers. We obviously get the full sequence here now, and honestly, this sequence itself, it's very short, but this sequence appears, to, at least to me, to be probably one of the best written Star Trek sequences I've seen in a while. And I don't mean that as a dig. I mean that they really elevated the bar here. Almost everything happening all around and the dialogue between the characters and their actions has a double meaning and is really laying the groundwork for what this season is likely to be about and the main plot points that are going to be occurring. I'm going to be doing an entirely separate breakdown of this sequence because it's just that layered and just that awesome. Another sequence that I really enjoyed was this fun shot of the greater Boston area. I really like this kind of Blade Runner-esque aesthetic they're adding to different Earth series and cities, I should say. We saw this a little bit in the trailer from one of the sequences where Dodge was walking through a street kind of all rainy and stuff like that, but this is obviously an establishing shot of one of the major cities on Earth, this being Boston, and I just love it. I thought it has a really cool Blade Runner-esque vibe to it. It's got these right color tones, and it looks futuristic enough to where it's like, okay, we don't have that right now, but it's also still relatable to what kind of technology we have currently, which I think is a perfect blend of what we want from Star Trek. The sequence between Dodge and her boyfriend I thought was very key. Now, the dialogue isn't really necessarily all that important other than to learn that she got accepted to the Daystrom Institute, but what's important about the sequence and the ensuing action sequence after these, you know, operatives beam in and attack Dodge and her boyfriend is that her boyfriend dies, and I thought that he was going to kind of continue living and maybe being a plot point for her as kind of a driving force as to what's going on with her character, maybe even continuing on with the adventure, but they kill him immediately, which really sets the tone for how serious the situation is not only for Dodge but for Picard and us as the viewers and who these guys in black really are. I thought it was a really well done scene. Speaking of that action sequence, though, I do want to go ahead and note that I really did enjoy Dodge's two main action set pieces throughout the entire episode. I thought they were well choreographed. It's still a little clunky because it's like TV action and it's not quite like a like a Jason Bourne or like a John Wick kind of fight situation. But I really thought that the fighting was probably some of the best we've seen choreographed inside of a Star Trek show. And again, that's not a dig on things that happened previously. But again, they're clearly trying to elevate some of these different set pieces and actions being taken on camera and it really shows. During the main title sequence, which again was fantastically done and well, well, well orchestrated by Jeff Russo, I love the fact that they had these little shapes that were there that were kind of separating and becoming these different DNH strands and it ties back into a plot point later on that we discover at the end of the episode. I like the fact that they do this. They did this also with Discovery where they include little Easter eggs in the title sequence. It's a bunch of different things, but it's also got little, little bits of stuff in there that if you're paying really close attention attention to, you will actually be able to uncover a bit of plot point here. So I kind of teed in, they did that with the time crystals in Discovery, so I, I wanted to really tee in on this situation with the title sequence for Picard because I felt like they were going to do the same thing again, which they did because this is clearly telling us and revealing to us a major plot point that we uncover. So really well done. 
My thoughts overall on the theme was great. I thought that it perfectly captures probably the main point of the show, which is that it starts off a bit strange and rather unique and then kind of builds up into a TNG style theme and eventually the TNG theme, the Star Trek theme, I should say, and kind of just crescendos into this amazing Star Trek adventure theme. And I think that's what the show itself is going to be. It's this weird kind of smaller thing kind of happening that we're not really quite sure about. And then it's going to slowly build into this epic more Star Trek-esque adventure, which is essentially what they're trying to do over this 10-hour movie, as you know, Sir Patrick Stewart has described it. So I thought it was really well done. I think it's perfectly capturing the tone of the show. Another little thing that I really enjoyed was the fact that Picard spoke French. He hasn't really done that, and I thought it was fun. He speaks it to number one and a few times to his Romulan caretakers, which we also find out for sure. They are, in fact, the same two Romulans, the Tal Shiar operatives that he meets in the Countdown comic series. Something I really noticed throughout the entire episode is that they did a very strong effort to layer different things happening in sequences that kind of have a different focus. So in this one here, it's a conversation between two characters in the kitchen, but what's on the screen is actually a bunch of information kind of telling you what today is and what's going on in the next sequence, which is kind of ironically setting it up. So the, the background stuff, which is on the screen, and the dialogue are both connected in a way, but they're having two different conversations about it. And on this one, we actually see a res what appears to be the rescue armada. Now, that may be either going to the Romulus, you know, uh, you know, part of the uh, Beta Quadrant or returning from the Romulus Beta Quadrant after the Mars attack, but they're clearly covering it on the newscast. So I thought this layering thing was really well done, and they do it multiple times throughout this episode. So just a fantastic job all around by the production team. So it's kind of a trope in kind of television and movies that when a news anchor is there to interview someone and they have like a makeup thing and they're like really focused on the way that they look, that usually means that they're there to cause some drama and some contention and angst with our main character who they're going to be talking to. And that is clearly the case here. So as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, no, this lady's going to she's going to beat up on our poor old captain, you know, our poor old retired admiral. But what was interesting is, again, with that layering thing is in the back corner is actually the painting that Data gave to Picard, the painting that he made 30 years prior of Dodge that he, you know, so it's it's kind of interesting how they kind of tucked it back there and you don't really focus on it, but it is obviously a central point to the overall storyline. So again, that layering piece is just really well done. I really enjoyed the meeting of Dodge and Picard for the first time. I thought her reactions were very genuine and felt very real as she was recounting what had happened to her that led her to him. I felt like his responses were very, very, very calming, very relaxing, very in charge. And he seemed to kind of have a little bit of life into him, you know, based off of the character that we seen for the first part of this episode he was a little bit kind of meandering and kind of just hanging out with the dog and hanging out with the on the vineyard but seeing her kind of definitely sparked something in him and he seemed a little bit more excited there and i think patrick stewart played that scene perfectly I will never get tired of seeing these guys in their tng uniforms i'm sorry it's just it's beautiful and i love it another thing that i really enjoyed was this fun little shot of the starfleet quantum museum i thought the idea of having a quantum museum was really cool and I just liked how they kind of dressed up this building with a little kind of digital logo and the words at the top. I just liked the establishing shot there. I thought it was cool. I thought it was fun. So for those of you out there who are going to be doing lore breakdown and teaser Easter egg breakdowns, this specific set of scenes is going to give you like hours worth of content because there are so many things stuck inside of Picard's little museum kind of thing that he has kind of closed off. He has all of his different memorabilia items. We've got ship models. We've got the Captain Picard Day banner. We've got, you know, the Batleth. We got the stuff from all sorts of different awards back there. We've got the Curlin Nescar back there. We got all sorts of cool little Easter eggs from all of the different things that Picard has done over his career and I thought it was just so awesome I loved this room I could probably get lost and spend all day probably all week in this room kind of going through everything so really well done for them again this layering thing really shines through in this set of sequences something else I wanted to talk about that was kind of a big hubbub a little while ago was the lack of Akuta grams in Star Trek Discovery they are back full force inside of Star Trek Picard with a little bit of a refresher update I think they look fantastic I love the new color scheme and I think that they've kind of slimmed them down a little bit, but they still look very similar to what we've seen in the past. So whoever designed this, really great job. You've managed to capture the past and add a little bit of something new to it, which again is exactly what you expect from a Star Trek series. 
Something that I really appreciated about this episode is they're very deliberate with how they're unfolding the storyline, not only to the audience, but to Picard and the other characters inside of the show. I love the sequence between Picard and Dodge sitting on the bench where he essentially just goes straight into it. He doesn't try to dance around the topic of her not necessarily being a regular human. He gets right into the point of the matter, which is that she is likely to be a synthetic related to Commander Data and that his attachment to her is very, very high and he cares very much for her and I appreciated the fact that he kind of just got straight to the point unfortunately it didn't really matter because in the next fight sequence she appears to die and burn up because a Romulan seems to have spit acid onto her and now she's melting which is quite the interesting feat I'm not quite sure if she's dead I'm still on the fence about it, but uh, it's possible she may come back. It's just a personal theory of mine, but it's possible that she's also dead. And speaking of that fight sequence, again, like I just mentioned, the guys who are wearing all the black outfits who are chasing Dodge to either kidnap or kill her, it looks like they decided to go with the killing option because they couldn't kidnap her, are in fact Romulans. Now, what the heck they have to do with Dodge and other synthetics is wildly unclear at this point. I don't even really have a good theory as to what they're doing. Obviously, it's going to be related in some regards to what's happening on the Borg prison cube that we know about, the reclamation cube, as they call it in this episode. But what exactly is going on there is unclear. Another great sequence that I liked was this opening establishing shot of the Daystrom Institute at Okinawa. We've obviously heard so much about the Daystrom Institute throughout the, all of the decades of Star Trek, and it's just great to see this awesome shot of it kind of here in Okinawa and kind of get this really beautiful, beautiful set piece that they designed, obviously digitally, but we've seen it before in the trailers. We didn't know that it was the Daystrom Institute. There was a couple of the theories. I, one of my theories was that this was actually a rebuilt Romulan colony, but clearly it's actually the Daystrom Institute, and I loved it. I thought it was a great set piece both outside and inside. Another fantastic shot here is the B4 Soong Android stuck in the drawer. So we have on-screen confirmation that that is B4 in the drawer. And it looks as though that probably after the synthetic ban, after the attack on Mars, you know, everybody in the quadrant banned the use of synthetics. It looks like they disassembled him and probably stuck him in the drawer in lieu of completely destroying him. It's unclear if the other synthetics that they were building in the Daystrom Institute were all rogue or if some went rogue and then they decided to destroy the others or they just iced them because we do know that at some point, other androids will appear based off of the trailers, but we're not quite clear if those were made illegally or if those ones are from leftovers. But it is nice to see that the B4 android is in that drawer. I love that sequence. And we got a whole bunch of interesting plot points that I'll kind of get to at the end of this uh, episode. The final sequence of this episode, we meet up with Dodge's sister, G Asher, Dr. Asher, as she's called. I believe that that means that Dodge's last name is also Asher, and she has a similar wearing necklace. She looks identical to her sister. Obviously, they are twins. And we see her on board the Borg Reclamation Cube. What she's doing there, what her purpose is, or what the purpose of the cube is, I'm not quite sure. But we did get this fantastic shot of the cube at the end, which I really wanted to share because I also love that very much. Okay, so now let's get into some of the little plot threads that I want to talk about. The first one being that Data painted the mural, two murals of Dodge standing there on the ocean, the one that Picard goes and finds in his, you know, in his, uh, uh, you know, museum room and the one that's hanging up inside of his house at the Picard Vineyard. What's interesting is that they were painted 30 years prior to the events of this episode. So it was around the year 2369. Now, there are a lot of things that happened in the year 2369. The biggest one that happened was that the Preserver, you know, archive was located. The whole adventure with the Curlin Neskar and where the Klingons and the Kardashians and the Romulans and the humans were all met up with the preservers and they found out that life was seeded by a specific race of, of beings long, long, long time ago. That was the biggest thing that happened there. It's unclear if that's going to matter at all to what's happening with Dodge and Data and this mural painting, but I did want to point that out. That's kind of the big thing that is popping out in my mind, but it could also be a, just a benign date. It has nothing to do with anything, but I just thought it was weird that they threw out a specific year like that. So I am... Curious to see if something happened in that year that forced or maybe got Data excited about painting that specific painting that he then named Daughter and then gave one to Picard. So that's quite interesting, I thought. Another big plot point that's going on is what's happening with Dodge and her sister Soji. Now we find out at the Daystrom Institute from the character Agnes that Bruce Maddox, you guys may remember him from the TNG episode Measure of a Man, the guy who wanted to take Data apart to make more soon style robots, was in charge of the Federation's efforts to build synthetic life forms. And we do know from TNG that Data and Maddox worked a lot, you know, through correspondence to kind of continue the work just short of actually disassembling Data's population 
positronic brain. And we also know that Maddox did help Data construct his very first daughter, which was Law, which unfortunately didn't really work out, and Data had to decommission her. Now, what happened is, according to Agnes, is Maddox was in charge of the Daystrom Institute building these synthetics. Then the synthetics rebelled for an unknown reason, attacked and destroyed 90,000 people on Mars, decimating the planet, destroying the Utopia, Utopia Planitia shipyards, hopefully Jordy's still alive, but destroying the Utopia Planitia shipyards. And then once the all of the major powers in the quadrant signed a treaty banning the use of synthetics and building of synthetics, Maddox left the Institute and went underground. But before he left, he had a theory that just from one single positronic neuron from Data's neural net, the neural net that he downloaded into B4, with one single, essentially, cell that he could then replicate Data's entire memory from there and essentially make a flesh android or a next level android that even exceeds Data's capabilities and know-how. And what I believe right now, unbeknownst to Dodge and Soji, who clearly didn't even know that they were synthetics, what I believe is Maddox fled the Daystrom Institute, went to Seattle, Washington, which is where Dodge says that she's from, and with the help of the woman who appears to be Dodge's mother in the show, they probably made these androids in secret and gave them false memories. Now, the big thing here, as we learn from Agnes, is that when doing this thing with the whole positronic neuron replication thing, that it creates a pair of android minds. It's not just one. So he made them girls and he made them daughters of essentially Data, which kind of connects back to a theory I had a little while ago that she was going to be connected to Data, some kind of lineage style, which appears to be the case. Both characters are seem to be that way, at least from what we understand right now. But I don't think that the girls really realize that their dad, in quotes, dad is in fact Bruce Maddox. I think once we eventually meet up with him, which I hope we do, the actor that played Bruce Maddox back in the day is still alive. So hopefully we do actually meet up with this character to find out what the hell it is that he was doing. And maybe he gets the opportunity for an explanation as to why he did this. And I do believe that he made them daughters and to look very similar to the painting that Data made all those years ago. I don't think like Data received a message to force him to make this painting and that was connected to what their appearance was. I think that Maddox saw the painting and decided to make them look like that as a homage to Data, who clearly wanted a daughter because he made his own daughter way back in TNG, who was Lol. I think he did that as a homage and as a respect out of Data's desires to have a daughter. The next thing uh, plot-wise that I want to go ahead and talk about is Picard apparently retired from Starfleet right after the Mars attack. It appears as though the Romulan rescue armada left Utopia Planitia. Picard was in the Romulan space area trying to evacuate 900 million Romulans and other various sentient life beings. Then the Mars attack happened and the Federation put a whole kibosh on the entire Romulan rescue armada and recalled the entire fleet. And Picard resigned over this decision because he did not believe their, you know, their intention to abandon the Romulans essentially to fend for themselves and to evacuate themselves away from the supernovas kind of explosion was was the right decision. So he resigned in protest, and that seems to be the falling out between Picard and Starfleet. He felt like that doctrinal shift of abandoning their responsibilities to the Romulans, even though they were their enemies for so long, was just flat bad choice, bad thing to do, and probably disagrees with the idea of banning synthetics outright because obviously he cares so much about Commander Data and he believes wholeheartedly that synthetics could in fact be sentient life forms and that they could be its own entire being of people that, that could exist with, you know, organics essentially. So that's kind of the other plot piece there. It does seem as though that the Romulan supernova did happen in 2386. There was a kind of a back and forth between 87 and 86 based off of the date that Spock provided, you know, kind of in Star Trek 2009, but it does look like it was 2386. Something else I want to go ahead and talk about because somebody brought this up on Twitter. The lady that's interviewing Picard where they have that kind of argument says and refers to the supernova as the Romulan supernova, not the Hobus supernova. Now, the whole Hobus thing came from Spock's line again in 2009 where he says a star in the Hobus system is going supernova. Hobus, what we know on stellar cartography, is outside, like right on the border, super far away from Romulus and on the outside of Romulan space. She refers to it as the Romulan sun, not the Romulus sun going supernova, because I think her viewers and probably the mentality of the Federation, uh, based off of the fact that we abandoned them, the Federation abandoned the Romulans, is that that whole sun business was the Romulans' problem. So she refers to it as the Romulan sun. 
because that's their issue, not the Federation's. It was contextually written in a way to seem sensationalized and to kind of spread that kind of isolationist abandonment kind of viewpoint and to get a rise out of Picard because she clearly knows that he disagrees with the fact that the Federation abandoned the Romulans in their hour of need. So it wasn't that they got it wrong or that they are no longer calling it the Hobus Supernova. It's that she was intentionally wording it in that way. And you got to really kind of pay attention to the context there and how it is that she's wording it because she's attempting to get a rise out of Picard. And I thought the sequence was actually really, really, really well written. Okay, so that basically covers the majority of it. Again, my feelings on this episode were that it was just fantastic. I think that this was a perfect episode. I think that the sequence with Picard and uh, Data at the beginning was probably a perfect scene. I haven't seen anything like that in forever. Just so great. And, and really, everybody all together has completely knocked this entire thing out of the park. And I am cannot wait for the rest of these episodes and i'm very even more excited now that we already have a second season because i know that i'm going to want more than just what they're giving us in this first season but that wraps up my kind of spoiler review and breakdown and plot overview of what's going on with picard i am absolutely curious to hear what you guys and gals think about this episode and what are you excited most about to see moving forward in the season get your comments up down below and we'll go ahead and get the conversation started live long and prosper my trickies 